Welcome, Stephen. Okay, afternoon. Every Can you hear me? Okay. Thanks. Okay, cool. So. Good. Um, afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. My name's Stephen. I'm working for Red Hat, but I'm here talking about something completely different from my day job today, which is uh, Sphinx readers, writers, and stuff that you can use for um, as an alternative to Panduck. So we did a quick show of hands a few minutes ago on who'd use Sphinx and who'd use Panduck. So I'm guessing most of this is going to be, um, you're going to know this all already. So I'm going to skip through it nice and quickly. But a quick overview of restructured text, docutils, and Sphinx, and how they all kind of build on each other. So for anyone that hasn't seen it before, this is restructured text. It looks kind of similar to Markdown. Um, something slightly different, not quite as simple to write. If you use it very, like the basic level stuff. Uh, restructured text, though, differs from Markdown in that it adds a whole load of additional uh, functionality through these things, uh, roles and directives. Roles are inline things that you commonly use for things like cross-referencing other documents, cross-referencing terms, that kind of thing. Directives are something you can use to um, generate code or generate documentation from code, transform documents, whatever the hell you want to do. Uh, very, very powerful um, functionality. So restructured text is the syntax. Docutils provides um, what most people would see as like the reference implementation of restructured text. It's been around for years. Uh, provides, a, so for example, GitHub, their readme renderers, that's all using the uh, docutils tooling under the hood. Sphinx builds on top of this by providing some nice little additional functionality, such as the example to build up books of documentation, cross-reference between different documents, that kind of thing. We're going to go into this in more detail shortly. So under the hood, most people's experiences of docutils is going to be something along the lines of they write a restructured text document, they pass it into one of the tools like the REST to HTML tool, and on the other side of that, they get this nice pretty HTML or PDF or ODF document or whatever they want. Um, so for the most part, you kind of think of docutils as this black box that you feed stuff in and it chucks something out the other side. But it, DocuTools itself actually provides some tooling that can kind of help you understand what it's actually doing under the hood. The uh, REST to XML or REST to pseudo XML tools give you a pretty good illustration of this. Um, you feed in your restructured text documents and you get out something resembling this for like a very simple document. Uh, this is the pseudo XML. It's like an XML YAML hybrid thing that makes it a little bit easier to read. But um, you've got this duck tree model, similar to HTML, I guess, where um, everything is basically rendered into that, and DocuTils is taking that and converting it into whatever else. It also has this tool that will um, skip applying transforms. I'm going to go into that very briefly, or quite shortly. But through looking at that, we can kind of um, explain Go, you go look at your, the source code, you'll see that DocuTils has this four-step process for converting something from restructured text or markdown or something else into whatever you want out the other side. Readers and transforms, the first isn't that interesting because it's basically pulling the text out of actual files. Uh, transforms are interesting, but I don't have enough time to go into them today. So I'm going to be mostly focusing on the other two, which is parsers and writers. Sphinx then builds again on top of DocuTils. Um, you, the workflow is slightly different. You give it a restructured text document. You also need to give Sphinx this uh, configuration file, which at a minimum should say what your, um, what your root document is. And then there's a whole load of other stuff you can do for configuring extensions and that. Not going to go into that here. Ultimately, though, instead of using something like the REST HTML tool, you'll use the Sphinx build tool. You'll tell it what builder you want to use, where your source files are, and where your output should go to. 
and the output for something as simple as this is pretty much the same because it's a one document um, tree. Sphinx, because it builds on docutils, also uses the readers, parsers, transforms, writers. It makes some modifications to them. That's not that important, uh, the modifications it makes. What is important is that it builds on top of those four things with another set of things. The most uh, visible of those is uh, the builder. So your HTML builder, your PDF or latex builder, whatever other builders uh, you'd want to write. There's also some, it also builds on top of like nodes and transforms and stuff. All that isn't that important, so I'm not going to go into that. So Markdown is in the summary of the talk. Um, it's one of the parsers that's um, currently available for docutils. There's another one there, which is for Jupyter Notebooks. I've never used that. I've used the Markdown and Restructured Text one. Uh, and obviously, it is possible to write um, additional ones for ASCII doc or whatever you fancy uh, converting. Uh, using these from docutils is pretty much the same kind of workflow. So the Markdown um, parser is provided using the uh, recommon mark package. And that package provides this nice little common mark to HTML tool, which works just like the rest of HTML tool, only you point it as a Markdown document, you run it, and it chucks out a load of HTML out the other side. And that, because that document was basically a Markdown version of the restructured text document, the output looks the exact same. And again, you've also got this pseudo XML thing. You get to see that the duck tree model that it's building, again, almost identical. You are, when you're using the markdown uh, parser, naturally you are going to lose a lot of the power that restructured text gets you. But if all your documentation is written in markdown anyway, or people refuse to re use restructured text for whatever reason, this allows you to kind of keep using the same tooling um, in the form of docutils or next up Sphinx that you've always been using. So from the Sphinx side of things, again, for restructured text, you had the restructured, uh, the RST to HTML tool. For the Sphinx version, you just use Sphinx build with a builder. Uh, you basically do the exact same thing for uh, the markdown. The only thing that changes is you need to tell Sphinx um, how to pass these particular markdown files. This is all documented as part of the recommon mark package itself. And also, the uh, Read the Docs website has some really good documentation on this. But in summary, you're just saying that markdown files should be parked with this, uh, passed with this common mark parser. And we're going to build to HTML, and it's going to give us the exact same thing. So that's the input side of things. On the output side of things, you can do almost the exact same thing. So docutils itself provides a whole load of writers. So this is just a few of them. The most common ones, naturally, would be the latex and the HTML one. There's also a PDF one. I think there's a talk at the Python room tomorrow on uh, the REST to PDF package. But, but those and then a load more available um, on PyPy. So for example, the rest of HTML5 one, which is packaged, gives you HTML5 as opposed to HTML4 or XHTML output. You can also call all of these things programmatically if you want, which can be pretty useful if you have some external tooling that you need to call, like you don't want to be called uh, out to your shell. And naturally, if you wanted to do something else, so for example, the rest to text tool will take a restructured text file and it'll strip out a lot of the restructured text semantics and give you something a little bit um, simpler. That can be useful for things like uh, you're building an RPM package from a Python, pa Python file and you want to strip out all that restructured text because it doesn't, it's not readable um, in plain form. You use this tool. And when you install them, most of these things provide a, a similar um, program. 
Sphinx again builds on top of this. Variants of pretty much all of uh, the writers that provided with docutils. The, again, HTML and LaTeX tend to be the ones that most people use. It has the text one. Man pages as well, I see used in a lot of projects. We, use them quite, we used to use them quite extensively in OpenStack, not so much anymore. But uh, calling these is uh, the builder arguments, the dash B. You also can do it via make files. Sphinx Quick Start will generally include a make file that will let you call all these that way. And again, you want to try a different output format. It, there's builders available for pretty much any output format that you can think of. Uh, I'll give an example here of the ASCII doc one, but again, if you want to render straight to PDF uh, and skip the whole LaTeX step, there are builders available to do that. In terms of writing your own parsers and writers, I'm going to give a very quick summary of this, but I find it tends to be very hard to uh, explain this stuff in the form of a presentation, so I've given a whole load of links at the end of this uh, presentation, and the slides will be shared afterwards. That's probably as good a resource as any, uh, and I'd recommend going reading into those if you're interested in this. But from the parsing side of things, um, all that a parser needs to do is take in um, a file that has already been loaded by one of the readers and convert it into one of these duck tree models. So you can think of the duck tree model as something like the, the intermediate model that LLVM uses. Um, it is the like canonical representation of your document, regardless of what format you're using for input and output. Passing that, I'm not going to go into how you pass documents because that is a two-hour class by itself. What we're going to do instead is we're going to cheat. We're going to take the um, the output of the REST to XML tool, and we can simply pass that back in and regenerate this docutils uh, or the document model that we wanted. It's kind of a nonsense example, but it does show you for that passing like can be a very simple thing. Uh, you'd use this, so you would use this for example if um, some of your documentation team insisted on using ASCII doc for example, or heaven forbid if they wanted to use docbook or something like that. The important thing that you need is that the input format has to be in some way kind of semantic because so for something for like um, trying to pass, pass um, uh, graph files, for example, would be next to impossible because graph is more focused on what the output looks like as opposed to semantics. There are some semantics tied up in it, but not in the same way that you'd have with restructured text or HTML. In this case, where you can use the uh, XML utilities built provided as part of the Python standard library, pass your document, um, re-render that back in, and you get your nice doc tree model out the other side that you can get and go and write to HTML or whatever you want to write it to. Writing is significantly easier than passing, which is probably why there's so many, um, so many builders and writers available. All that that does is you need to provide a translation layer um, for something like the pseudo XML or the XML file. All they're doing is they're writing the dot tree straight out to a file or out to the screen. For something a little more complicated like that, that REST to text writer that I demonstrated earlier, they use uh, translators. And all a translator is is that it has a node visitor and a node departer. For each one of those, you determine what you want to do. Most of the, if you're going to write uh, one of these writers, generally ends up being a state machine where you're just keeping track of where you are within the documents and what the output format should be. Building on top of this from a Sphinx side of things is pretty simple. The only thing that Sphinx will do from a uh, builder side that don't, doesn't happen with the writer is it will keep track of the cross-referencing between documents and it will also, um, also resolve those cross-references at building time.
So, in summary, you've got Sphinx, DocuTales. They're pretty much the same thing under the hood. Sphinx is a, a superset of DocuTales. They all use readers, parsers, transforms, and writers. Sphinx modifies those ever so slightly, but for the most part, they look the they are almost the exact same thing. Sphinx just tacks on stuff on top of that in the form of the builders, the application and environment, the latter two of which are more um, applicable if you're writing directives or roles for Sphinx. There's multiple writers and builders available for both DocuTils and Sphinx. You can use DocuTils just fine by yourself if you're happy not to have that cross-referencing and translation or anything else that Sphinx gives you. Uh, not all of the writers and builders that exist in one exist in the other, but like the set between the two is pretty much everything. And there's a load more available on PyPy, um, ranging most of them being writers and builders, but there are passes in the form of the Markdown and the Jupyter play, uh, playbooks. And if you decide to go and write your own, the Sphinx documentation, quite funnily for a documentation tool, is pretty awful. But the DocuTils documentation is excellent, and they provide a like, rake of information on um, anything you could want to know about writing and passing documents. So outside of that, I think we've still about five minutes left. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Go for it. Um, and the main reason I use Pandoc, unfortunately, mm -hmm. is uh, for converting Markdown restructured text and stuff to Word. Yep. Is that possible? There is a DocX writer. The standard of it, I don't know. I've only used the ODF one, which naturally you can open that in Word as well. But they do exist. Cool. Does exist. Yeah. Yeah. I have a crazy workflow where I want to write a markdown and then but people want to review it on Google Docs, so I write it to the doc file and then upload it to Google Docs. <laughs> so that's just a, that's a whole other story. Are there passes for DocX? I don't know. So I I spent oh many weekends working through um, and are trying to convert the ASCII.Python uh, implementation as opposed to the Ruby ASCII doctor one into something that could render uh, a DocuTils like, document model. And it turns out that there's a reason that they switched away from the Python version of the ASCII doc uh, tooling. It's really bad. It's really crafty. Um, so I'm, I'm basically halfway through rewriting that from scratch. But the, the two ones that I've seen are marked down and restructured text. The issue I'd see with the word thing would be the lack of semantics around the document. It's quite hard to know that this is a title, uh, this is a code, and so forth. Quick question. Can I take a picture of the audience? Is there anybody who doesn't want to be in a picture, a thank you tweet picture? Oh, no, I don't want to be. Can you hide it? <laughs> <laughs> Grab this guy first. Um, once you have a large implementation of this time, is there some kind of tool that can help you manage, for example, Ruby on So, like refactoring your documentation, essentially? <laughs> Not so much. The, um, the, the guidelines that I normally see enforced, so oh, I'm working on OpenStack, that's my day job, and we use Sphinx for everything. Uh, moved away from Darkbook years ago. and. The guideline that we usually have is um, so you can reference documents via like the doc role or you can use the ref role. Using the ref role means you can move the document wherever the hell you want and it'll just keep on cross-linking, whereas if you use an absolute path or a relative path to something, as soon as you move it, you have to go and update all those references. So yeah, sticking in like a, an anchor at the top of your document and referencing that way. I don't think don't know if that's exactly what you're getting at, but yeah, things like subsection getting way too big and you have to make it a section, then you have to change all the reference. 
Yeah, we we so for the pure link or pure avoiding having like to fix those cross references, we use the ref tag instead of the doc tag. Um, the other thing that we do a lot in Opus that we have tooling that will um, generate a or what are they called the the redirects the Apache redirect file. So it will you'll say I want this file to that was living here to now point here. It'll generate that the H, HT access file and those are deployed on the, um, the documentation servers. So we had a document living here. Someone goes to access that and, so, and they get redirected properly. I know read the, read the docs lets you do that, but it has to be done manually. That's about the only kind of tool we have around there. Move splitting up sections, and that tends to be a pretty manual process. You're able to use anything within the common mark spec. Uh, in terms of the extensions, I don't know how it actually handles those. It should be able to render them, but I don't know. It would be able to render them for the built-in ones, but I don't know how Sphinx will handle. If they get converted to a DocuTools node, then it's fine. But I'm not sure. I haven't experimented too much with the extension. If I want to do extensibility, I usually jump into restructured text. So just a remark. I mean, Spring with Remark and Markdown is working kind of with the common mark, but it's not always really stable. But there's quite often if there's a new release of common mark, then Remark is broken for some time mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And also the the they are not always 100% uh, in sync with features. Compatibility wise. So it's uh, exactly. It's, it's, it's working kind of, but it's tricky. You have to know that if you really decide to use it together. Mm. Interesting. What did you use for this uh, Google Docs. <laughs> yeah. I wish I could have used Sphinx, but uh, I had the, yeah, we, but to be honest, if I, I still do presentations in PowerPoint if I could, just because I've been broken in yeah. in that regard. Um, I've never used Sphinx for actually documentation. Oh, for presentations. The, no, the only rest in here is raw. Still use. You do have. Yeah, this there is. Yeah, um, my colleagues use Beamer main like raw source, um, but there are builders available for in DocuTils for Beamer and also this JavaScript HTML. Yeah. I just never use it because I never, I just haven't gotten around to it yet. Yeah. Any last questions? If not, okay. Great. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, can, can you be more specific on why SKDoc input is problematic? Um, very, very briefly, so it uses, um, it's, it was, there's two aspects to it. The first one is that the code itself is really old, the Python code as opposed to the Ruby stuff. It's all this, this it's all in one giant file, um, like what you consider like modern Python practices, so like using setup tool, using actually anything to install it. I think they have a make file to install stuff. Um, Tux testing, unit testing and stuff, all that is very 90s. Um, so it's quite hard to kind of start working on that. It's also been a pretty much abandoned at this point. There is a Python 3 uh, four or fork of it. They have it running and passing all of the built-in tests, but I don't know if anyone's even using it. And then lastly, how it's actually implemented, they use this like streaming parser, which leaves means they have a couple of issues, like for example, they can't rend their top trees, table of contents are all JavaScript based, because I think they, they need to pass, up, pass over it twice to basically build up their document model and then they can insert the, the table of contents, which is what DocuTils does by way of a transform. It, it just doesn't, the two don't really map very well together, so there's a lot of downsides and given how crafty it is, I can see why they just, someone decided, wrote a fairly good implementation in Ruby and ASCII Doctor has basically taken off since. Yep. You need a lot of TLC. Okay.
Thank you very much, David. Thank you.